Good evening. How's everybody doing this evening? All right. Praise the Lord. Are we ready to praise the Lord? We're ready to sing praises to our Lord and Savior. Well, all right. Will everyone please stand? Nothing else could 
take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace help me find a way bring me back to you back this evening. Thank you for being here. Let's go, Lord, in prayer and ask his blessing on the offering. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you for this night, for this opportunity to come together in your name. I pray that you'd bless this evening in a mighty way, Lord. Uh, bless the, uh, the, Iwana work, the Iwana workers as they're uh, preparing for this year, getting ready for the kickoff next week, Lord. And, uh, bless the discipleship program as it's taking place across this building. And Lord, the, the time here. In your word, Lord, the, the time in prayer at the end of service, I just pray that uh, your, your spirit would be moving in this place tonight in a mighty way. Bless this offering. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. stand. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. 
very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry way. Master of the sea, the Lord's His will obey. He's your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me.
Amen. It's good to see you all back this evening. If you'll take your Bibles and turn them over to Psalm 74. Uh, look at this psalm here this evening. So the psalm we're going to look at tonight is uh, essentially a, a petition uh, for God uh, to help His people and, and to remember uh, the, the promises and the word that he has for his people. Um, but this is not something unique. You know, this has been the case for God's people throughout the ages of time. Them crying out to him, uh, those who are devoted to him, saying, God, um, help us. We need you now. And again, I, I think it's appropriate uh, seeing where we're at in, in our world and, and in our days, our time. Uh, I think it's an appropriate plea for us to say, God, remember us. God, help us at this point in time, because uh, there's things that are completely out of our control. Um, again, so, so important for us to understand, uh, with a moral decline in this nation, there's, there's two sides, uh, I think, to the, the church's responsibility, um, and, and it's this. We, we have to make sure that we're being devoted to God's word uh, and, and not, not giving over to the system of the world uh, because I think that's where the church has, has missed the point. You've heard me say it many times before. Um, we've turned our focus in many ways, I think. The church as a whole, not necessarily Trinity Baptist Temple only, but uh, the church as a whole in America have turned our, our focus to comfort from devotion. Um, again, we look at the first church, and that's exactly where they were. They, de they were devoted. And because we've done this, I think the enemy's kind of pushed the line back a little bit further um, in, in, in our nation. I mean, so, so you look at today all the things we're dealing with, and I've said this before as well, you, you ask yourself the question, how in the world did we get here? And, and some of the things that are, exist and, and, and are, are, are out there now, it seems like, man, that, it happened quick. Within a matter of a few years, it seems like we went from, from here to way over there. And, and um, again, at this point, because of this, I think there's some panic going on. Uh, a lot of Christians are, are panicking with what the future holds. Um, you know, I, I heard someone the other day say, you know, if, if, if it goes this direction, then you can just, uh, the, the future generations can just forget it. And, um, you know, my, my concern is maybe that's already been done. You know, if the church has given itself over to comfort uh, and, and instead of being given ourselves over to devotion to God, um, then maybe we're past that point. You know, um, so it's not necessarily a panic, but I, I know for me, uh, I'm not necessarily panicking, but I'll be honest with you, I've shared this as well. Um, I'm frustrated, you know, that's, that's where I feel like I am. I'm frustrated um, because, you know, I see y'all, I see uh, people who are striving and, and trying to be devoted to the Lord and, and trying to be a witness, trying to be the light. And then for every person like that, there's others who claim the name of Christ who are, are giving themselves over, if, if not two to three per, people more to that one who's devoted, are giving themselves over to comfort and just like it, it, defining their Christianity, defining their relationship with God as something that suits them versus being followers of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, again, I think that's where we get. And then the other, the other element that's maybe their frustration mingled with disappointment. Uh, because I think most of us in here, probably all of us in here, are, are very patriotic. And so when you look at America and you look at our greatness, there's no doubt as Christians, we think, man, we got here because of God's hand of blessing. There's no, no doubt about it. And the, 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 the miracle of America, and I'll just say, just, this is just earthly terms, earthly uh, kind of judgment, but man, America dominates the Olympics, you know? I mean, I know there's others up there, but I mean, in the history, you know, you look at modern history, and you look at what's going on, and you think, how did a country that's been around for just a couple hundred years get so dominant in so many things? You know, and again, that's just an earthly thing, but I think it's, it, it's a contribution, or, or, or points back to the fact that God blessed us so abundantly with, with resources and, and, and people, and because of where, where we started. So you, you look at where we're at now, and it, it's not only frustrating, but it's, it's disappointing. It's disappointing that we're here where we're at in 2016 and the moral climate of our nation is, is what it is. And so I want us to, to know this about this. We've uh, you know, addressed this a couple times before, but if God's judging America to its end right now, if that's where we're at, 
Um, that maybe we've crossed that line, as I've said before, and, and God said, okay, here it is. Here's the final judgment for America. If we're in that, here's our only response as the children of God. This is the only response that we have that, that's acceptable. Repentance for our own sins and devotion to God with all of our heart. So if that's where we're at as a nation facing the judgment of God, because we haven't been who we're supposed to be, and, and the enemy has pushed that line back, then our only, our only response is to repent and to, to be absolutely devoted. And I'm not trying to sound like a, a downer, but we have to be real. We have to be realistic, and we have to talk real talk. That's not to strike fear. That's not to, to induce panic or anything like that, but to, to bring reality to the fact that, you know what? We're in the last days, and the, the temperature is what it is. Jesus said that it, it will look like this in the days of Noah. That's the way it's going to be in the days of the Son of Man, the days as it was in, in, in Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's exactly like it was going to, it's, it's going to be in the last days. And he told his disciples, you can tell the seasons, you can look at, at what's going on in the world, and you'll be able to tell what's going on. He told the Thessalonians, hey, that day's not going to overtake you as a thief because you're not in darkness, you're in the light. And so again, I think most Christians look and see and say, something's different about this time that we're living in than times before. There's been times before that I, I'm sure people thought this is the end. The 60s, I, I wasn't there. People thought it was the end, right? Or they didn't know what was going on. I mean, either way. <laughs> Little of both, that's right. <laughs> they didn't know what's going on, so it must be the end. Um, but again, I think we're living in a, a very unique time and um, a very dangerous times, just as the Bible says. But again, if, if, if God is judging America on the other side, if he's judging America to its return, so if he's judging America to, to its end, in other words, there's no more America shortly, um, then our response is, is repentance and devotion. But if God is judging America to its return to him, the same exact response is what his children need to do. Repent and be devoted to him. Amen. And so again, when we look at this psalmist where we're going to read, we're going to see him crying out to God and saying, God, remember us. You know, the, the enemy's coming in and, and, and doing all this stuff to the sanctuary, to, to your congregation, to your people. Remember what your promises are. Remember what you've told us. And we'll get into that a, a little bit tonight. But I, I want us to, to get a grasp of that, you know, of, of talking to God and say, God, remember what you've promised. Remember what you've told us. And we'll look at that, uh, the, the perspective of that heart, that heart perspective from there. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for allowing us again to be here. I pray tonight that you would just uh, speak to us, that we would be encouraged, that we'd be strengthened. Lord, even if we need to be convicted tonight, I pray that you would have your will in our lives, God. Uh, Lord, we've already seen the importance of, of being saturated in your word today. Lord, of, of clinging to your truth, uh, of holding to your truth and being guided by your truth. Lord, realizing your power, the power of your word in our lives. And I, and I pray tonight as we continue on and see that a little more. Uh, God, that, that we would have ears to hear. Lord, that we wouldn't just pass it up and it wouldn't be something that's just repeated. It would be something that is very clear that you're trying to, to talk to us, your people, about. And so, Lord, just use me as a vessel. Accomplish what you want to accomplish tonight. We'll praise you for it all, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Then Psalm 74 is going to start reading verse 1. Oh, God... Why hast thou cast us off forever? What a question. Why have you cast us off forever? And again, some people feel panic. Some people feel frustration. Some people feel disappointment. And some people may feel like that in those emotions. God, I mean, have you just got rid of us? I mean, we pray. We pray for leadership to be saved. We pray for the direction of our nation to be changed. We pray for certain people not to be elected and certain people. And, and, and it seems like things are still going that way. And the question come, God, where are you? Well, why are you not answering the prayers of your people? I mean, there are two or more gathered together. There I am in the midst. And if, if two, are, you know, two agree on anything, then he's going to hear an answer. Why, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you answering these prayers? Why aren't you answering our cries for help? It goes on and says, why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Again, what an amazing question. Do you hear what he said? Why does the smoke or the, thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? He's talking about your people. Why, why are you, God, are you, are you angry with us? God, are, are, you, are, you, are you exercising correction or judgment? You know, the Bible says if the judgment, judgment begin at the house of God. It's talking about us making that decision for ourselves. And if we don't, God in his love will judge us. He will, when that word judge, he will correct us. 
he will chastise us. And so again, the, the psalmist is saying, listen, God, you, you, you're, you're not doing anything. It seems like you've cast us off. And, and, and what you are doing, it seems like your, your anger is kindled against us and, and we're your sheep. Remember, the Bible says that the Lord chastens those who he loves. It's so important for us to get that. He's not okay with his people not going his direction. And so I said before, America, we look at what's going on, the chains, you know, the, the wheels falling off, everything coming loose. That's why I've said so many times, I believe it's the church. Because God's not going to forsake his people. He hasn't forsaken us. He's going to be with us to the end of the world. He promised that. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to correct us. He's not going to chastise us. He's not going to to be filled with the right kind of of indignation against sin and against his people not going his direction. God's not okay with that. Evil men are going to do evil things. We know that. That's just the reality of our lives. They're going to be judged at the judgment. That's the truth. We saw that in Psalm 73. We saw that back in Psalm 37. We can't fret over evildoers. We can't get focused on what, good, what bad people get good. We can't do any of that because they're going to have their time at the judgment that they'll pay for the evil that, they're done, that they've done. But when the righteous do evil, we have to know God in his perfect justice is going to execute correction. We have to know that. Again, as, as a child individually, that's the way it happens. If you don't feel correction from God when you sin, or when your heart's not right, or when, your mind, when, when, when there is sin existing in any form, shape, form, or fashion in, in, in our life, and you don't experience correction, conviction, something, something's wrong. The same can be expected for a nation. If the people in that nation, and, and, and the, the majority constitute the people of God, and those people aren't doing what they're supposed to do, going God's direction, then we can expect nothing else other than correction from a just and holy God who loves his people enough to say, you continue to go that way and it's going to get more difficult. You know, it's like we said before, we talk about our, you know, being parents, grandparents, uh, you know, when you're growing up, uh, you, you know, get corrected. I, I know we still, it's going to get worse as it goes. You keep doing it, it's going to get worse, right? I, I know when I was a kid, when I, I was tardy, I was late, I wasn't home when I was supposed to be. The first time, it might be a warning. The next time, it would be a grounding for a week or two. The next time, if I was still late, it would be grounding for three weeks and taking this away and taking that away. It got more severe as it went on. And so again, that's, 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 that's us, earthly judgment. That's not perfect justice from God. So God and his perfect justice, when we continue to go the wrong direction, the longer we go, we can expect it's going to get more difficult. There's going to be more uh, correction coming the longer the time goes. But even with all that, even with that truth, that reality, that God is just, that's how he operates, that's how he corrects, it can be hard to, to comprehend, to digest the feeling of rejection, of correction, of feeling alone, of feeling like, like you're not connected to God. In these, it can be hard to understand that feeling. And especially for those who are trying to follow him. And I think that's kind of where the psalmist is coming from. And again, many of you in here, you, you're trying to follow the Lord. You're, you're trying to be obedient, trying to be the light. You're trying to, to, to be a part of the mission of the church. It's getting the, the, uh, the light to the lost and, and all those things. And you're devoted and you're in the word of God and you're praying and you're faithful and all those things. And you are that person. You are those people. And, and, and yet still you look around and the nation is where it's at. And people are where they are. And judgment's still going on. Again, it can be hard to understand that feeling of, well, doesn't God see me and my devotion? Doesn't God see me and my faithfulness? Doesn't God see me? And again, that's where the psalmist is coming. God, have you cast us off forever? And we're your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. And it seems like your anger just gets kindled more and more. Aren't there more people than just me? Aren't there more people than us? Aren't there more people than, than just a few churches around? God, surely you haven't done this. But listen as he go, goes on in verse 2. He says, Remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. I'm going to say tonight, 
If we are living in obedience, this can be our prayer. If you're living a life of, of, of humble obedience to the Lord and you're devoted to God, this can be our prayer. If we're in sin and we're not, we're, being, we're omitting, we're, we're in disobedience, then we need to repent and then this can be our prayer. It's so important to note that God doesn't forget. God never forgets. The only thing God forgets is our sin when he forgives us of our sin. But God does not forget his promises. God does not ever forget what he has promised and told his people. So while this prayer is made from the psalmist to God of him not forgetting his people to remember his congregation, the reason why he's doing this and the reasons why it's so important for us to look at this is because it's a practice of faith to recall the, the promises. And not only the promises, but the in, inherent character of God in keeping his, his, his promises in times of testing. So when we say, God, you promised that you would do this. God, you, you, you promised that you would reward. God, you promised to always be with. God, you promised to have your ears open to the righteous. You, you promised all these things. God, please remember these things. It's those who, in, in, in line of obedience, the line of obedience, who can pray this prayer and again, use this practice of faith to recall the promises of God, the character of God, especially in times of testing. You know, that, that's one of the things that you and I can do when we're going through trials and, and, and struggles in our individual lives, is recall the promises of God. And that's one of the things that you can, you can preach to yourself when you're struggling. Knowing the word of God and, and reciting it to yourself, encouraging yourself in the Lord, encouraging yourself in the word of the Lord. That's what David did. David encouraged himself in the Lord, the Bible says. And when you're going through a test, when you're going through a trial, when you're struggling to, 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 to understand, you know, sometimes we look for outside sources, we look for something else tangible that's going to give us what we need in our, in our moment of, t- of trial and testing. But I, I want to encourage you with this. Remember the promises of God and recall them to God himself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And this is something that we can learn from so importantly, I think, in this season of our life. As we petition God, we have to do something, though. If you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord, if you're going to recall the promises of God, if you're going to, uh, to uh, again, be lifted up in that time of trial and testing with those things, you've got to, do, you've got to have something. You've got to have his word inside you. You've got to know his word. If, again, if you don't know the promises of God, if you're not putting the promise, the, the word of God inside of you that contain the promises of God, if that's not something, again, that we talked about this morning that you're being saturated with, then when that time of testing and trial comes, guess what you're going to do? You're going to be searching. You're going to be seeking. You're like, oh, I, just, I, I, don't fi- I don't find any encouragement. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to feel. I don't know what to pray. But if the word of God is saturating your heart, you're seeking after God's face. Those moments can come and you begin, to, you begin to encourage yourself in the Lord of the promises of God. And sometimes you know directly where to go. I will share this, and this is, I'm just sharing this. There's been times that, that I've, I've really felt um, defeated and down and discouraged. And there are certain psalms that I have marked in my Bible. Certain psalms that I have underlined and starred. And I know to go to those psalms. When I'm feeling certain ways, uh, whether, it's, whether it's just uh, outside things or, or, or just turmoil within, whatever the case may be, knowing to go to certain places is so important. So I urge you tonight, this is a vital element. This is so, again, we talked about it this morning. It's a vital element in our lives to saturate and not only saturate our lives, but meditate in the word of God. Psalms chapter 1 gives us very clear insight about the, the importance of this. It says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And look what it says. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then he explains the product of this day and night meditation Delighting in the law of the Lord, he explains, he says, and he, he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Did you get that? He's going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that gets its nourishment, that gets its, its strength. He's going to bring forth fruit in his due season. 
And everything he does is going to prosper because he's rooted and he's getting fed from the water of the word. But he explains the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. His word is invaluable. There's no value that we can place on the word of God. It's beyond all value in this world. It's priceless. And again, I want us to get this importance because we, we, we have come to this place, I talked about this morning, of being entertained and we don't handle and, and taste of the word of God the way that God intended us for us to taste and handle of it. We're at a place where, where we've so far departed as a whole, I'm talking about. Maybe not some of you, maybe not most of you, maybe not all of you. But in general, we've come to a place where the word of God is not our source of power in life. It's just something that we, we have in our life. It's not the source of the power of our life. And I want to encourage you today, this morning we talked about it, this evening we're talking about it, the word of God, especially in these days, has to be our source and our power. We've got to be saturated in it. We've got to be meditating in it. Psalm chapter 119, I've been doing this for a while, and I don't know when the Lord will ever let me complete it, but um, it seems like every time I go to do it, it, something else adds on. But a few years back, um, I, I, w- I had the teachers coming up uh, in the academy at um, 7 o'clock in the morning. And there were a few of them that were coming at 7 o'clock in the morning. And, and what I was doing is I was sharing a devotion uh, that God had put on my heart to write. And I began writing a devotion out of Psalms chapter 119. And, and I've got something like, I don't know, 30 or 40 or something like that, uh, different devotions. Uh, but, but what God put on my heart is to write this uh, through the whole book of Psalm 119. Because in Psalm 119, it has so many different issues to address, but it all surrounds the importance of the Word of God. If you look, read Psalm 119, some of you have probably already done that before, but if you go back and look at it, I encourage you to start reading it um, tomorrow or tonight or whatever. Begin to go through Psalm 119, and you're going to see this great influence, this great importance placed on the Word of God. I, I just want to read uh, the, the first Uh, a couple sections of it. It says this in Psalm 119, verse 1. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way. Listen as it right off the bat. Who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. You hearing it? Law, commandments, precepts. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed or put to shame. When I have respect unto all thy commandments, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Skip down to verse 19. It says, I'm a stranger in the earth. Hide not my com- thy commandments from me. What an amazing verse. I'm a stranger in this earth. And so I need your commandments to guide me through this. I love that. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. I love that too. My soul breaketh. My heart is breaking. My soul is breaking. It longs for your judgment, judgments, your word, your commands, your law at all times. What an amazing desire for the word of God, for the commandments of God. 21, thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Did you get that? Princes did sit and speak. I was attacked. I, I was attacked and accused and, and, and they had this mindset, but you know what I did? I, I, didn't, I didn't retaliate. I didn't, I didn't fire back. I meditated in your statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. And I love that too. Thy testimonies, your word, your commands, your judgments, your precepts, They are my delight and my counselors. If you're looking for wisdom, if you're looking for direction, if you want to know how to react, how to feel, how to how to handle, you're looking for all those things, it's contained in the Word of God. But it's not just gonna it's not gonna be done if you just say, Okay, God, I really need help today. You need it, you you're gonna have to just, you know, uh, come on. You know, it it doesn't happen like that. It comes by saturating yourself in the Word of God. It comes for us by meditating on the word of God and seeking his face. In the troubled days ahead that we face in in our nation, in our lives, we've got to get this one thing clear. Our our battle equipment, 
the thing that we are to do war with, the thing that we are to do battle with, is not clever words, not clever arguments, not anything like that. But as the people of God, very clearly God has equipped us with something so important. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul explained in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So to try to convince somebody that they're wrong as a Christian, as a child of God, in the flesh, with fleshly mindset, with worldly wisdom, is a futile attempt. He goes on to explain, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He would say to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The only thing that's going to help us through this life and the only thing that we've been equipped with to handle everything in this life is also the, the Holy Spirit, but the word of God. And if we don't know it, and we're not handling it, we're not meditating on it, we're not saturating ourselves like that, that tree planted by the rivers of water, then we're not going to be strong. We're not going to bring forth fruit. We're not going to prosper in the things that we do. It's only by being planted in the right place. Again, we saw the power and authority of God's word this morning, the great demonstration in fleshly form that Jesus uh, gave to us and gave to those people there in, in Capernaum talked about the power that still exists today to save through the word of God. And I want to say tonight, we, we've got to be foolish to think that we stand a chance to please God by faith. If faith is the thing that comes by hearing the word of God. We're not going to live a life on this earth to please him without faith. And if we don't know what God's word says to operate by faith every day, we can't please him. So again, we go back to that thing about being more committed to comfort than devoted to God. And, and we look at our Christian lives today and say, but where's the disconnect? I, I, Rochelle and I were talking about that. And, and, and I don't know, it's just so frustrating because there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect with, with the people of God and, and, and our nation and, and and what is it? Where is that disconnect from, from devotion, absolute devotion to God's word, to his church, to his mission, all those things, and where we are today? What is it? And I firmly believe as we are not being energized, we are not being empowered by the word of God. We're not connected to it like God intended for us to be connected to it. We have got to be in the word of God. In the same way, we've got to be foolish to think. On top of that, that we've got a chance in the battle against our flesh without the word of God empowering us. There's no way that I have power in my own flesh to have victory against the flesh that pulls against me. The Holy Spirit's inside of me, and, he, and he's, he's doing a great job of, of convicting, convincing, and instructing just exactly what Jesus said he would do. But I've got to have the word of God in me. I've got to have it regularly in me. I've got to make sure that I'm staying true and in the word of God so that the Holy Spirit is using those things to, to teach me and instruct me and guide me and convict me. And all those things, again, that's what God desires for, for us in, in his word. And furthermore, we are foolish to think that we have any chance in the battle against Satan who has power and authority in this world and his demons without being empowered by the word of God as well. So again, we have to see this as our source, as our strength in everyday life, but it boils down to this. It boils down to desiring victory more than defeat. I've shared before, I don't, I don't like losing. I'm not saying that I, that's just the way I'm wired, you know, specifically in competitive things, but there's a greater, there's a greater zeal, greater desire and zeal. That's a new word. I'm going to write that one down. That's not in the dictionary, brother. Zeal. Um, but there's a greater desire that I have, a greater zeal that I have to see victory for the, for the church, for the Lord in the spiritual realm than anything in this world. I, I, hate to see, I hate to see what's going on in the world because it feels like the church of Jesus Christ is losing the battle. Now, we're not going to ultimately defeat it. The gates of hell cannot ultimately prevail against us. But it feels like 
the church is kind of getting our tail kicked right now. That's what it feels like to me. It feels like the church in America has, has turned from the power source, the word of God. And again, I, we could go on and on and on. There's so many churches today that are driven not by the word of God, who don't do what we do, not, not saturated in the word of God, who aren't instructing verse by, you know, all those things. There's so many churches that are, that are giving things out there, that messages that, that flower the ears and, and tickle the ears. There's so many of those things that are truly looking to build a kingdom for man and not the kingdom of God. There's so many churches that shy away from, from encouraging people to share the faith. That's the mission of the church. So many churches are, are geared to, to do other things that suit themselves. And again, there's no way we're going to ever see victory without the word of God empowering us. There's no way. If you don't know the word of God, the word of God uh, isn't in you, then the promises of God are not in your mind and heart either. So you can't battle. You can't battle in prayer with the promises of God in there if you're not there. It goes on, look, look back in our text. It says this, Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. The, the, the enemy had come against the sanctuary of God. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. He's talking to God. They, they set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up Axes upon the thick trees, but now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They were destroying the sanctuaries of God. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogue, synagogues of God in the land. We see not our signs. There's no more any prophet, neither is there any among us that knoweth how long. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? And again, I don't know about you, but I read this and I start looking at where, where our nation is, start looking at where the world is, and I'm, think, I'm saying, I, I've not necessarily prayed it in those words, but had those same thoughts. God, how long can the enemy keep going? How long will he continue to gain ground? How long will the church continue to be pushed back in this battle? How long is this going to go on? God, please help us what he says why withdrawest thy hand even thy right hand pluck it out of thy bosom again the psalmist in his mind he had pictured because of all that the enemy had done against the, the congregation of god against the, the synagogues of god all the, the enemy all the, the 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 land or the 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 ground that he had taken in the spiritual battle that he's saying god it seems like you're sitting by you cast us off you're sitting there with your hand Fold it in your bosom. Take it out and help us, God. Please help us. Verse 12, for God is my, is my God of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat in the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. You, you divided the fountain and the flood. Thou driest up mighty rivers the, the day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, he says, that the enemy hath reproached the Lord and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm reading this prayer and this cry to God. And I'm thinking, we should be praying the same thing. God, you are all powerful. God, you can speak the word. You have spoke the word. You divided the sea. You created the seasons. You, you make night and day. You, you, you can do anything you want. You are all powerful. So please help us. He goes on and says, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove and the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto thy covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Oh, let not the oppressed return to shame. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. Arise, O oh God, and plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. If you have a Bible, I encourage you, you you're struggling with what's going on in our world and how, how the, the evil seems to continue to go and, and, and that's the battle we face, you can underline that. Look what it says. Arise, O oh God, and plead thine own cause. Work for your own cause. God, you are righteous. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You have a will on this earth. 
please arise and, and see it accomplished on this, world, on this earth. So remember how the foolish man reproached you daily. These people that are against you, these people that are working abominations against your name, they're doing it daily. God, stand up and do something, please. Forget not the voice of thine enemies, the tumult of those that rise up against thee increaseth continually. Again, over and over and over, it seems like the same things that we face in our world today. The tumult of those that rise up against thee increase daily. I read an article just today of some, um, somebody they, uh, they, they caught uh, with ISIS uh, linked to that thing that happened over uh, that cartoon that that lady uh, organized and, and those, uh, the guy tried to come up and shoot a couple of cops at that uh, place and they ended up uh, shooting him, as, I think, earlier this year or maybe it was last year. Um, but anyways, this guy was connected to, to homegrown um, sleeper cells. And uh, his, they, they, ha- they had a plan. They have a plan. And that is to attack certain people. Many of you read uh, about a, a kill list recently. 15,000 names. You know where they got them? Online church directories. Ours isn't online. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Only for members. But that, that's what the enemy is looking to do. The enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's looking to stop Whatever movement of God to stamp out the name of God, he's been trying to do that for all time. Still trying to do it today. The psalmist was claiming the promises of God, and tonight, as we pray, I, I, I want to submit to you this evening, this is what we need to be doing. This is what we need to be praying. See, it's not right that there's a murder of about a million lives every year in this nation. Amen. It's a spit in the face of God. It's a spit in the creator of life's face. The one who's so blessed, richly blessed this nation, it's a, it's a turning around and saying, we don't need you. We despise you. It's not okay. It's not right. The abominable joining together of same-sex relations. It's a spit in the design of God. It's not right, the influx and the acceptability of premarital relations to spit in the face of God's design for marriage. And it's not right, even the deceitful conduct of government officials. God sets up. God's in control, absolutely. God God will use evil hearts just like he used for Pharaoh. He'll use righteous hearts He'll do all those things. God is in control, but it is not pleasing to God for men to act the way that they're acting today. And so our prayer needs to be very clear, I believe, tonight. Very, very sincere. Number one, for souls to be saved. Continue to pray that. That's on our prayer list. We'll continue to pray for our leaders to be saved. As Timothy says that. We need to pray that repentance enters. Absolutely. For these evil practices to, to be brought down. But in that prayer, in our prayer, our response to be, should be living lives that are wholeheartedly devoted to the word of God and to his purpose. The mission of getting that light, that gospel to those who are lost. See, we can't sit in, in comfortable criticism. It's easy to do that, but we can't sit in comfortable criticism without being a part of the solution needed abroad. It's easy to sit back and say, well, this is wrong with our nation, this is wrong. It's a lot easier to do that than actually being in action, being a part of the solution. But that's where so many Christians stop short today. So many. It's easy, it's easier to say that sinners have a problem than to be a part of bringing the solution to them. It just is. It's easy to say, look, these people are, you know, this person doesn't need me in government, this person is a liar, this person is this, this is this is this is that. But you know what? I may not be able to go and talk to the president and share the gospel. I may not be able to go to talk to the, 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 the people up for election and, and, and share the gospel with them. But you know what I can do? You know what we all can do? We can all share the gospel with the people in our lives, in our area, 
And if every child of God would be determined from here to Washington, D.C., from Washington, D.C., over to California, if every child of God would be determined to be devoted to God's solution for sin, which is the gospel, then we might see things change in this nation. But again, it's easier to sit back in, comfort, in, in, in comfortable criticism and say, this is what's wrong. Let's pray tonight that we'll have the right heart, we'll have the right mind, we'll have the right motive to see God's glory, to see God's, his honor resound in our lives and throughout our nation. Let's pray with passion, but let, then let's move with action. Do you get that? Let's pray with passion, but then let's move with action. I want to ask our ushers to come tonight and I just want to spend a, a, a few minutes tonight, just about five minutes in prayer as in groups and um, groups of two or three. I think most people have been a part of this, but if you haven't, just get with somebody or, or two other people and uh, we just pray through this list. One person can pray or, or everybody can take turns praying through this. Again, we'll take about five minutes to do this and um, you'll hear the music begin to play. We'll open up the altar. Uh, the cards will be here, but uh, let's take about five minutes tonight as you get these sheets. And uh, again, let's pray with passion. And then after this, let's move with action. Amen? All right, let's pray.